It's Chris. Lose your games. So, let's talk Kickstarters. What's coming out this week? What has come out? And what you should know about them. Full disclaimer, though, at the front of this video, of my poorly organized master list that I have of upcoming Kickstarters, dates, titles, all that sort of stuff, just even being a scant into February at this point, the list that I have compiled is probably already double the size of what it was for January. So be aware that there is a lot more coming out. Now, obviously, all of it's not going to be of interest to you, but the more stuff that comes out, the more the chance there is going to be something else that catches your eye. So spend wisely. Also, if you're like me, there are a lot of big projects coming up, one seemingly each of the next months. ISS Vanguard, then we just had Primal, which is mine, then Bloodstones is coming in about two weeks, then at the end of March, March 23, you have Mythic Battles Ragnarok. So again, be aware that some big heavy hitters are coming, and you know there's going to be other stuff popping up in between as well. Okay, disclaimer aside, hey, I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers as well. We are two thirds of the way there, so thank you very much. Uh, because as several people have pointed out, a thousand subscribers gets us the community feature, I guess, on my page so that we can actually like talk there instead of just in the video comments all the time, which is actually kind of cool. I don't really have a Facebook page or anything else like that set up or a whole lot of other social media. So thank you uh, two new Patreoners. I prefer that word. I'm sorry <laughs> for those of you that don't like that. I prefer that word. I just it's funnier to me anyway. So thank you again for that. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, it means that hopefully people are liking what I'm putting out there. So if you do, thank you. Thank you. Okay, enough blabbing. Let's get to the games. First up is Maquis, the second edition reprint with new content. And unsurprisingly, a solo worker placement game, two very unique aspects that you don't really see combined hardly at all. It's already over almost seven times its funding goal. So that's, that's pretty significant. I, this was a game that was sort of running out of print, and that's why it finally got around to getting a second reprint, and it's getting new missions along with that. Again, personally, you know my taste by now. Uh, worker placement does nothing for me, but I recognize that there are a lot of people out there that do solo, and this has a pretty good reputation just from what I've heard in the background as being a good solo game. So... You know, it seems like the really already a month into Kickstarter, you've seen a lot of interesting stuff pop up solo wise. I'll say right off the bat, though, both of these first two games, I really like what they're doing design wise in terms of the campaign, because both of them are very straightforward. You want game, you get one pledge level for game, <laughs> period. Twenty nine dollars. Now, I think this game is probably a lot smaller than what I would compare to uh, the size of other worker placement games. But for $29 plus, I think it's like like 6 bucks of shipping at the bottom for US, $35 for a relatively well thought of worker placement game that is just solo. So, I mean, that's that's maybe what you're paying a little less for. That's That's actually a relatively good deal because I haven't seen this one also pop up on the retail market at all, even though it was relatively well priced. So this is one where, unlike most of the worker placements that I would see on Kickstarter, I can't guarantee this one is going to come at a retail level in the future. And if it's any indication based off of what happened with the first edition, chances are less likely overall. So what are you getting? I mean, you're basically just getting some new missions, new spare rooms, new resources, tweaks for clarity and gameplay purposes. And they're very clear. Like, if you're getting the new one, the new content level... If you don't get it now, there's there's just a chance because, I mean, this is a very small publisher. This is a very small um, company in that sense. You're not going to have an opportunity to just pick it up widely available. There's not going to be a plethora of them just floating around in the Kickstarter space afterwards. So what do you get new? Like I said, all that stuff right there. It, it's relatively simple. Pick missions. Put your guys down. You got to put the police down as well. If the police land in the same place as your workers, they get caught. And then you just got to keep getting resources and running around trying to prevent them from basically destroying your town. Uh, the Nazis, I believe, in France is this setting. And again, a whole plethora of videos, all of the usual suspects, if you like that. Dice Tower, Quackalope, and a couple solos. 
that specialize in that. And I mean, that's about it. I mean, this is relatively straightforward. It's either going to be something you're interested in and you're going to go for it, or there's not going to be a whole lot of bling. There's not going to be a whole try and grab you, but with a noose and lead you into this, it's either here or not. So I like that simplicity in this situation. Second up, now this is core request. And again, I mentioned the simplicity and I'll talk about this in a second. I'll get back to the game itself, but you can see here, it's just multiple copies. One copy gets you one price, period. Two copies, price. Three copies, price. Four copies, price. $42, stretch goals, shipping. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my biggest concern out of the way. My biggest concern echoing comments from last week is that the age for this is six plus. I have a six year old right now. He's turning seven next week. I just got the second shipment of Tainted Grail in the mail last week. And he is super interested in that. He is super interested in other daddy games. Would this interest him? Maybe. I don't know. I haven't really presented something like this to him. But he is super interested in wanting to game with me with my games with the added complexity and everything that goes along with that. So my fear, and this was my fear with the worker placement creature comforts that came on Kickstarter a couple months ago, was do I really need this sort of bridging tweener game for kids to play between sort of the habas and the adult level games. And there is a big gap there in that market. And I can see how that is very appealing. At the same time, my son is not expressing that he wants to play slightly more advanced kid games. He wants to play advanced adult games. And so that would be my issue with this. Now, I have a five-year-old who can't read yet. So that might be more his ilk right here. But he's going to want to do also what his brother does. He wants to play Pokemon TCG with us. He doesn't want to play, you know, Hoot Owl Hoot or Outfox anymore. He wants to play what we're playing. And so that would be my fear is he would get this, but he would want to play Tainted Grail like his brother does and just skip right over this. That being said, I love this for what it is because it is true to what it is. They crowdsourced the pictures. They made it very accessible. They made it very simple. And yet they made it engaging. It's encouraging creativity because you can create your own characters and print and play them and they give you the format to do so. They give you the rule book for how to create them essentially, not just a rule book, but how to actually make them appropriate for the game. And they give you just a basic explanation. It's nothing complicated. It's nothing overly wrought or unintuitive. It just makes sense. It's just straightforward from the, the moving, the questing, the abilities, and they've even added a little bit of a pressure mechanic so that you cannot use your special ability every single turn. You have to use it and then it has to charge down this little card until it gets to the bottom before you can use it again. So you have to time it that way. So you're teaching kids a little bit on that aspect. And then also, if you don't explore a new tile, it's going to go down on the, t the counter marker for this little spider track. And when the spider track gets to the bottom, all these spiders spawn and attack you. So again, a little bit of pressure uh, from that side for the kids to be experiencing. I, I don't really have anything bad to say about it. It just is a well-thought, well-put-together project. And if you're looking for something where you don't want your kid playing something older, or you're really looking for something in between that is more graphically appropriate, this is a perfect thing. The price is relatively good. I love the fact that they did not try and overbling it. They did not try and give it a whole bunch of miniatures. I, I take these quotes with a grain of salt. Um, they're they're very they're very nice. They're very happy, uplifting quotes. But I think just overall, it just seems like a well designed game. This seems like a, a very good staple that would be suitable in in any household. Except if you just don't want to see monsters. But then you could create your own too. And that's the other aspect I love of this. is They allow you to really create your own monsters and draw them. That would be the one aspect that my almost 7 year old would be interested in. Because he is a better artist than I am at this point. <laughs> I have no qualms about saying that. But he is also more interested now in painting miniatures. So I think that's sort of going to slowly replace what this aspect would otherwise represent. But I like the fact that they stand eat it. They did not try and miniature it. They didn't try and overcomplicate it in terms of the components. It is just a nice fit for what it is. So I give them a lot of kudos for that. And it shows because they're already over three times their funding goal. Tons and tons more stuff seem to all launch 
on Tuesday. And as a side note, scrolling through these to try and find them, so many miniatures, so much D&D, so much zines that it's ridiculous. It's like all of them are launching all at the same time. Anyway, side note. So this is Embryo Machine, a mecha war game. Now, when I first looked at this, as you know, as I've stated many times in the past, I'm a big fan of the Japanese imports. What I'll say with this one is just on the get-go, the thing you need to know about this is this is a port of a Japanese game that's already out there at retail and has done, as far as I know, relatively well and is well thought of. So this is not a game that is being developed. This is not a game that is being tested. This is a game that is already out to retail. So you can see, you can go to Google, you can search this, you can find translations on Japanese websites of reviews of positives and negatives. So it really has a little bit more standing than a lot of the other things that you see on Kickstarter normally because there is a lot of unknown. There's less unknown with this one. Now, the thing I'll say is, and I didn't really realize this, is this is a war game. And so I'm probably going to be out just by that fact. I'm not a big war game person. But having looked at the page a little bit, having, having read the rule book a little bit, it definitely does a few things to stand out. It's got a lot going on. And I know people are kind of mixed opinion about the coloration and sometimes the name in these situations, but they really seem to have done a good job in attracting their core audience. The pledge level is pretty decent. It's $45. Depends on, again, I think the pledge being $45, whether or not the stretch goals are going to be good enough. And, you know, I like the fact that they just threw in everything else. So if you want all the other stuff, it's not terribly more expensive. $30 for the acrylic standees, the metal tokens, the custom stuff. The question just is going to be, is this going to be widely available at retail? And probably not knowing a lot of these Japanese games. They just they just tend not to be easily accessible at the retail distribution level in the U.S. So especially if the stretch goals are halfway decent, it's something that should be on your radar if you like more of a war game or the mech theme at all. Because we don't also have a lot of mech type games. They just haven't really translated well onto the board game scene and not many people have ventured into that because it is sort of a niche within a niche so what are you getting into this so you have nine different mechs you have a lot of combinations of things they talk about 240 cards that you're going to be able to equip and use armor and the interesting thing is it uses a the deck mechanism as sort of a way to customize it so it's you have armor cards but armor cards depending on if you're a light a medium or a heavy it what it changes is the amount of armor cards in your deck as a whole as you're drawing them so it's not that your armor takes more hits it's just that you have more of them to be able to block attacks so you can draw more in the first place not necessarily that they do more Again, you're getting a double-sided battlefield. You can put both of these together. You can use one of them. You can play one-on-one. -on -one. You can play one-on-two. -on -two. You can play two-on-two. -two. There's teams. You can put the battle boards together if you want to use the full thing. And so here you get into a little bit of the actual boards themselves. And believe me, having looked through the rulebook again, they are complicated. There's a lot of spaces on there, but most of it is relatively intuitive so i don't really think there's a big learning curve in oh my gosh what am i going to do what is this number okay this is your move number this is your initiative number this is how many cards you draw this is where you place this upgrade this is where you place this upgrade at the bottom this is where you put the card you're playing first this is where you put your card the playing the second i mean it's it's relatively straightforward the interesting thing in this is that it is not last one standing period because i think that would be my biggest concern with a game like this you could go ad nauseum, just, you know, one person than the other, stalemate, no one wants to make the first move and expose themselves. So they put a self-contained timer on this game. You're playing 10 rounds. Person with the least amount of damage at the end of the 10 rounds is the winner. Or if you run out of, like, armor cards or something like that, or if you run out of weapons, those are the other sort of uh, endgame conditions. The artwork is done. I think it's just more of a translation issue. They say you're supposed to have it by the end of the year. The timing is going to just be how is shipping because shipping to the U.S. from Japan has not really come back up to where it was pre-COVID. So that might delay things. But all in all, you're getting a relatively established game. And if you want to try it out, it's on Tabletop Simulator. So we'll see what the stretch goals are and it, whether or not it's going to be worth it. I mean, I think the acrylic standees are something you could look at if you really, you know, of the three that I would be interested in the most. But again, uh, it just looks solid for what it is, and I don't think there's a lot of risk. If you like this and you want to check it out and you read the rulebook and it seems like something you'd be interested in, 
especially as a 1v1, I think it would probably be right, be right up your alley. But like I said, war games and that type, I thought it was going to be something slightly different. So I'm probably going to be passing on it. It's a solid offering. This is a solid, solid week. Thankfully, nothing is tempting me that much. Speaking of things that aren't really tempting me, uh, Core Worlds, Empires, and Nemesis. So the worker placement game that is in the Core Worlds franchise, plus the solo expansion Nemesis for Core Worlds. And they are almost at 50% of funding goal. I'll be honest, Core Worlds, I've heard it, and I've heard the deck building game, and I know a couple people in several of the areas of Board Game Geek that I frequent really like the game, but I have never played it personally, so I can't speak to much of what its predecessor really brings to the table but this is within that universe it's a one to four player worker placement game and the interesting thing as i talked about last week is they have this circular worker placement type board but i think it's worth saying i have a hard time judging worker placements on kickstarter and there seems to be a lot of variability in terms of what people like with worker placements and what people don't like because whenever i see people asking recommendations for kickstarters and worker placements invariably a couple of the comments are always there are so many worker placements out there that are already standing true to the test of time go with one of those these are much riskier now again that's true but if this theme appeals to you more if the mechanics of this of having a sector in space where your faction is trying to control things and trying to control it over other people like maybe more of a star wars rebellion type worker placement this might be more of your interest because it definitely is different than a lot of the other worker placements I've seen out there. And then you get into the deck building uh, solo version. Again, solo version doesn't do anything for me. But I know a lot of people, especially when it comes to deck building games, you're usually playing two-handed. And so this would be a nice change if you cannot have to play two-handed and just kind of play it with actual rules and not try and house rule it either. It's a, it's a lofty goal. These are stretch goals that are spread out pretty far. You've got a couple of Kickstarter previews by some of the, the bigger names here. It, it doesn't do anything for me. It's going to be an easy pass for me from a worker placement side of things. The solo is 20 bucks. The whole, wow, that's $70 is more than I was expecting. But I mean, that's not a bad thing. But when you compare it to some of the other games like Carnegie and Darwin's Journey, which were just on Kickstarter and the value you got with those versus this, that's a little tough. And I always have mixed feelings about when companies throw their other games you know i understand if you're going to throw core worlds in there but when you're throwing dungeon alliance in there i kind of feel like if you have people pledging for dungeon alliance here it kind of contributes a little bit more to the funding goal that is supposed to be really for core worlds so i always have mixed feelings about that i mean i understand especially if you want to get the product out there and you don't want to print extra as a small company it's it's definitely hit or miss for me. I don't really have a whole lot more to say just because it is a worker placement. I haven't done some deeper due diligence. If you're interested, um, let me know. I can give the rulebook a glance over and throw you some thoughts in the comments. But otherwise, I'm just going to leave it sort of straight there so you can investigate it yourself a little deeper if you want to. Next up, we have Post-Human Saga. Speaking of games that have standalone versions or expansions, and this is the latest expansion in Post-Human Saga. So this is sort of your post-apocalyptic uh, sandbox mission type game. It's already hit its funding goal, so that's not terribly surprising given its you know previous predecessors and pedigree. Basically, with this game, you're just adding more of what the Post-Human Saga had to begin with. More of a competitive tactical experience. You're getting points, you're laying down tiles to explore, you're exploring, you're completing missions and objectives, you're getting more map tiles, you're secretly going to play one of your actions on your turns, and then there's a story encounter to it. So what is new about this one? You're going to get explorer cards, you're going to be trekking and scavenging on terrain tiles, and you're going to be having cartographer cards which change the setup for each player each time you're playing it. I'm not that familiar with the base. This was one that never really appealed to me in the first place when I was looking at more miniature open world type games. Again, I'm familiar with it in passing, but it's not something that easily attracts me. The art is fine, the miniatures are fine. I've heard relatively positive things about it, but it's obviously not going to be a break the bank sort of game, as you can see just by the funding goal. And that's nothing against it. It's just, it's again, it's a niche within a niche. And especially when you're going up against such other high quality things nowadays, People are having to be really nitpicky. Why am I getting this? Am I getting this for 
FOMO? Am I getting this because I really want it? Am I getting this because I just want to have the complete set of everything? That's sort of where people are having to draw the line because the prices are all higher and because there's just so much more out there in the first place. And this is just Kickstarter, you know, let alone talking about the retail side of things. Gosh, I mean, could you imagine trying to do a video like this of the retail? <laughs> okay, guys, what came out for retail? I'll see you at the end of the video in like two and a half hours later. So you're getting all the stuff if you get the base game that came with the original stretch goals and all of the content. So if you did miss it the first time around, they're offering a lot of that, which is kind of nice, actually. You don't always see that, um, especially with some of the bigger companies. Now, is the is the cost worth it? $30 for an expansion? That's not too bad. $59 for, let's see, what, the base game and the mini expansion? Uh, okay. Uh, $79 for, that's, that's actually, looks like a pretty good deal. Especially, I don't know how widely available this is at distribution or retail levels. $79 is not probably bad. I wonder what the shipping is on that. So what is the difference, though, between the $79 and the $119? Because you're talking $40. $40 for Settlements Mini Expansion. So basically you're getting what, three? Oh, you're getting the Resistance Expansion. So an expansion and a couple other small promo packs. Uh, that's that's a lot. That's a lot for $40. I think your best bet is probably this $79, if it looks like, if this new content is really worth it. Sometimes you can make an educated guess how much do you need this little stuff that's going to cost you more. Uh, you see that with some of the big CMON campaigns, some of those little expansions, the value just isn't there. But sometimes people like myself get suckered in because we want the complete set of things. So not saying that's a bad thing. It's a great marketing tool, but it's something that I definitely keep in mind nowadays when I'm looking at these add-ons. You know, is, is this one, like, like, here you go. For example, this is a great point. Is this one hero worth $15? Is this mini expansion with this amount of cards, I don't know, however many that is, 16, 20, whatever it is, $10. This one follower worth $5. I don't know. It depends on how much you love this game. This is a known quantity. So if you're interested in it, you should just really check out these reviews that are out there because, and I really like, can I just say that uh, all of these campaigns, having rule books on day one really is nice. So thank you. Even if I'm not backing your campaign, even if I'm not terribly interested in it, I really think it's consumer friendly to have your rule book out there from the get go. Because when you don't, or when you don't have gameplay from the beginning, I'm looking at you Epic Seven Arise, that's, that's becoming more intentional. And then it makes me slightly more cautious. And I don't really want to recommend a lot of blind situations. I'm okay with spending money. I'm not nearly as okay spending money on blind buying anymore. Which, frankly speaking, which is a whole other issue, I don't pre-order at retail, like, ever. Because invariably, within a week to two weeks after things come out at retail, you can find them already for a discounted price on the Board Game Geek auctions, or you can try trading for them aggressively from people who already have them marked for trade within that time frame of their release. Because people pre-order probably more than people use Kickstarter, even though Kickstarter gets the bad rep. Anyway. Side tangent, you gotta you gotta you gotta rant for free in this video. So I'll I'll throw that in the comments so you can make sure that you're like, oh, Chris is ranting in the middle of the video. We gotta go to gotta gotta go see this if we see nothing else in the video. So okay. Sorry, sorry, post human saga, you got uh the brunt of that, but um it's not actually you. So anyway, post human saga, check it out. Cult of the deep. So 72 hours in, you're gonna get a set of free exclusive dice. And this is flying a little bit under the radar. I'm not sure if it's because social deduction. I'm not sure if it's Cthulhu or sort of the old gods type theme. But again, social deduction is a hard, hard market to find a broad based appeal. And with a game that markets itself as Cthulhu and you don't have a big name like Simon behind it, it's going to struggle just, I think, because Cthulhu nowadays just doesn't do enough to stand out on its own. Everyone looks at it as sort of like, okay, there's another Cthulhu game, you know, scroll on by. And I don't think this is deserving of that, but sometimes if that is what you're trying to make your focus on, it can much easier be lost in the shuffle just of the masses of other things that are out there. So what are you doing? Four to eight players. Again, that's an interesting player count, especially in the pandemic now, even though we're hopefully towards the end of it, four to eight players, especially for me, is difficult. Four on a good night, on an average night, five if wow, 
really hardly ever more than five in my group right now or even before covid a game that may play more optimally at a six to eight player count i don't have a lot of them i need to be very picky when it comes to those games in my collection because i already know that they're not going to get played that often so i have two or three staples that will fit and flow very well but you know something like uh, Blood on the Clock Tower, for example, I passed on very easily last year because I don't have the player count to do that. You know, that's a convention type game. That's going to be amazing. That's going to be a meta type game. If you can get a group of people together of like 12 or 8 to 12 on a regular basis, oh, then I would be all in if I could do that consistently. But no, I can't. And so that's the biggest thing when I see social deduction games on here with a higher player count. I go, can I actually get this to the table? The table test, the getting it to the table test for me, is by far and away the most important thing when I'm evaluating a social deduction game, more than the price, more than the components, more than the FOMO. The fact of the matter is, I can't get this game to the table, so I'm going to be passing just from that aspect. I've spent too much money elsewhere to have another game not get to the table. I would rather spend that extra 50 bucks or 100 bucks on Primal or uh, ISS Vanguard that I know I'm going to have a much, 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 much better chance of getting to the table more frequently than something like this. And that's my own personal thought. But anyway, so Cult of the Deep, a lot of character cards, a lot of roll cards. You have your Sigils, which are your special abilities. Your Wraiths, because this game takes the common criticism of social deduction, and it allows you to stay in even if you're eliminated. Ritual cards, reference cards. Thank you for having reference cards so that everybody doesn't have to be looking at one and everyone can actually figure out what they're doing at the beginning of the game and not have to have everyone explained multiple times throughout the game. <laughs> so what are you doing? You got a high priest, you got a Kabbalist, you got faithful, and you got a heretic. Heretic just wants to watch the whole thing burn. The high priest is trying to summon. The Kabbalists are trying to kill the priest. And the faithful are trying to protect the priest. But you don't know who's who. You're all going to have special powers. You're all going to have special abilities. You're all going to gain traits. And you're all going to be trying to achieve your goal. So this is the other thing that's a little bit different than a lot of other social deduction games. You're going to be rolling dice. And you have to commit these dice to either do the rituals, to stab other cultists, to gain life, or to give life to other cultists. So... Interestingly, I haven't really seen that mechanic too much elsewhere, where you're actively either not only taking away life from other cultists or other people in the group, but you're able to give them life. You really don't see that. And so that's interesting. So if you can figure out who is on your side early enough, <laughs> you hope, you might be able to save them from someone else uh, maliciously targeting them, or rightfully so targeting them, depending on how you feel about that. So again, you, you get eliminated, you're a wraith. And you can't commit your dice, but you can haunt the dice, replacing, discarding, or giving dice depending on who you think is who. So here they give an example of allocating those dice depending on what you get. Then you commit phase, again, lose life, lose life, gain life, or advancing the ritual. And so you have a lot of things that you can be doing, using abilities, powers gained from rituals, or your sigils in the response phase. So you're going to get a chance to respond to what other people are doing. It's not just you take your turn, I take my turn, they take their turn, they take... it's there is going to be some interaction as well. Again, they go over the, the altars here, where depending on the player count, you're going to have different amount of rituals, so you can advance those rituals. So what is the price point for this, out of curiosity? Okay, $5. Okay, $35 for the base game. Okay, that's not bad. And then $60 for a pledge. And $60 for the Kabbalist. Something in between, because I'm not sure what the value is going to be on this with the Kickstarter stretch goals versus this one because you have the the uh, tokens the coins a copy of a digital copy of a book and then another digital copy of the art book so there's not a whole lot to entice someone like me from a gameplay standpoint for the higher level and at the retail level with games like this i always wonder if again it's going to be cheaper at retail especially if i can get it with lower shipping so i'm not terribly happy about the price and again it's probably not a game for me in the first place it's something that i look at right now and i probably go i'd like to play it i wouldn't mind playing it once or twice to get the gist of it but it's not something i look at and i gotta go i gotta own this right now so it's probably a try before i buy and here you see some of the stretch goals new character cards alternative character cards added there you go that is cult of the deep next up we have the newest from Oint Games, and this is a three-pack. Moon Adventure, In a Grove, and Dokoyong. I don't know much about 
Link games, but I know they have sort of a cult following. I saw several people posting on Twitter in advance of this that, oh my gosh, Oink Games is going to be putting something out. I'm going to be all in no matter what it is. Now, I believe one of these, I forget which one, I'll scroll down here in a minute, is a reprint redone. I think it might be in a grove, but don't quote me on that. And the interesting thing I'll say right now from the get-go is the only reward level is to get all three. So I'm not, I'm not really a fan of that, to be honest, because I looked at all three of these and I kind of said, well, that one kind of looks cool. And then I scrolled over the pledges and, I, and it said, oh, well, you can only get all three for $62 plus the shipping. Shipping is probably going to run you between $20 and $30 because, again, they're shipping from Japan. So can I pay $90 or essentially $30 per these games that are more like the button shy games in the sense of how big and what sort of footprint they have? And the honest answer right now is no, I can't. Two of these three, this Dokojong is sort of a dog-based game. Moon Adventure is the one I think I was interested in. Uh, I can't remember. No, I can't remember. I can't even remember. Yes, Moon Adventure with the expansion pack. Uh, this is a co cooperative, challenging game. You're going to be trying to desperate mission to recover supplies on the moon. And they say, and this is really interesting. Again, I'm not a big fan of this. Like, I have no information to go off of. And you're saying, like, a week after you launch, almost, are you going to give me information about a third of the campaign? come on now as someone who's not an oinks person that's not going to make me super excited to come back or to check on it frankly speaking well like i said with all the other stuff launching it's just going to get lost in the shuffle for me because there's not a whole lot of information there in the first place trying to guess where your other people's dogs at so that one gets it is today and then in a grove this is the revised edition okay and so this is the one that i think actually most uh, interested me because in a town with too many detectives so many murders and you're blaming each other for their wrong deductions. I think this would be interesting, but I, I'm not going to buy it in a set of three for only one that I want. Again, this is something I feel like I would trade for or buy from someone else in the future if they didn't like it. Because what ends up happening with a lot of these sets that people buy is, yeah, they end up liking one or two of them and they try to get rid of the third. So that's how I would probably do it. And I want to see some more gameplay. I want to see what these games actually play like. I have no idea. The description is great. But until I see it a little bit more firsthand, and I don't care about component quality, I just want to see how it plays. So you could be using dice and uh, paper stock and wood chips for all I care. I just want to see course, sort of how it plays and how it's interacting. That is the trifecta from Oink Games. Next up, and I didn't even realize this one was launching. Someone posted it the day before, uh, I think on the 31st, that this was going to be all of a sudden popping up. And this is Clinic. Clinic is sort of the hospital simulator... Uh, resource management building type game and their second and third expansions to go along with it it's already almost quadruple its funding goal this has a game with a high following this is a little bit of a heavier game that's not necessarily super heavy but it definitely is one uh, you're getting the choice of one extension or two and then two extensions is 75 dollars and the ceo pack and that's interesting they're only allowing 120 to get the deluxe game with all of the stuff going along with it that's interesting i didn't even know that they even had pledges for like that and i wonder if they're going to open up more or if that was the stock they had from the previous kickstarter but you would think especially in a game like this that already has a hundred thousand dollars raised and there seems to be demand there if you could get more of those or if you can get more people you just put a pledge level out there and you say hey if we can get you know 200 more at this pledge level to get this we'll make it happen i think you'd probably fill it up so like i said hospital building management game 30 minutes per player. Can I talk about that for a second? 30 minutes per player, 60 minutes per player. I think that's awful deceiving. Or it's sort of the artificially way to make the player count and the time of the actual game and the investment required a little bit make you think it's a little bit lower than it actually is because you're playing this with four players. It's probably not going to be two hours, especially if they're all new. So you're building your clinic, you're a CEO, you're getting three dimensions. So what do these new ones actually add? So they delayed it because of COVID. Yep. Two expansions, solo multiplayer campaign. So what is new? Hundreds of new 3D meeples. Okay, sure. So what are you actually getting? Oh, you're getting a whole bunch of stuff. They're, they're actually, and I'll say this about this, it's actually sort of true to style. Scanners, beds, coffee makers, uh, pediatrics, special modules with emergency room and radiology, public toilets, wheelchairs, gift shops, air conditioning. So you're getting a whole lot of just practice, you're actually building it. Uh, four sorts of patients, babies, burn victims, critical patients, and unclassified patients. So that's sort of an odd grouping to have together right there. <laughs> and then the solo campaign book. I know next to nothing about this game. So what, what are you doing here? So basically there's three different modes. 
you're going to have the ability to pick an expansion or a, a module to add to it and you're going to make you know anywhere between up to 50 or you know, 10 to 50 scenarios depending on how they want to put it together solo gaming second extension components so they give you a little bit of that stuff that i just mentioned the pediatric the radiology the resuscitation hub tiles and then you get to the third one with the four different types of patients and the advanced parking and just everything else. So you're getting your money's worth, I'll say, from that side of things. This is probably, like I said, though, too heavy of a game for me. I've heard great things about Clinic from people who do enjoy heavier games. But this is one of those where the theme is appealing, but the actual gameplay, again, is a pass just by what it is in the first place. But this is probably, again, probably one of the most solid games in terms of, I know I'm saying this almost in every one, this is probably the most solid of all the ones that I've mentioned this week in terms of what it has already offered and the overall design, just from what I've heard in the rumor mill. This is like the week of, if you like some, more is better. We're seeming to see a lot of that right now. So I'll say, having glanced at the rules just briefly on this, they say that the extension number two adds what? Additionally... 13 more expansions on top of the six expansions that come with the extension number one and the third extension adds just tons more modules and tons more of everything this is a 20 page rule book for number three and again when i talk about heaviness i was definitely right because they actually refer to heavy cardboard in the rule book for number two extension and i mean you can just see each of these things has its own little caveat and own little play style and phase one phase two phase three so they all do something different this is not a light reading necessarily to me again if you're a heavy gamer this is probably the best heavy game that's out there right now on kickstarter like real heavy apart from maybe the other two that i mentioned carnegie and darwin's journey but this one has more of an established baseline whereas those are both going to be new properties way too heavy for me 22 page rule book here just for the all the different extensions and expansions and modules so it's definitely outside of something i'm ever going to be interested in but obviously i am not the target group either because it's already raised almost a hundred thousand dollars and it'll probably be double that by the time it ends there you go clinic deluxe Okay, so that is it for this week's Kickstarter Roundup. February. It's going to be a beast. Watch out. Tomorrow, I'm going to have my upcoming list of games you need to be on the watch for next week. And then we're getting into the Ides of February, so watch your wallets, folks. Also, this weekend, I'm going to have my January Roundup in terms of what I backed, what I didn't back, what's new to my collection, what left my collection, a little, little bit of everything sort of approach. So we'll see how that goes as well. Thanks, guys. We hit 700. I am just blown away. Again, thank you. I really mean it. See you around. Stay classy out there.